this is um, our first um, virtual uh, program, educational program that the education committee has developed. Um, so I really want to thank um, the education committee for putting this together. Um, this is new for us, um, so we are certainly looking um, for feedback, um, but let's be positive with feedback as this is the first time that we've done something like this as getting together um, is a little bit more difficult in, uh, right now than it uh, typically is. Um, before we do get going, um, I really want to point out the bottom of your screen right now uh, to our elite premier and diamond partners. These partners really have gone above and beyond above for NEWA and, and is making NEWA the success that it is. Um, and our, our two elite partners are Franciscan Health and Ivy Tech. And what does that mean? Uh, these, uh, these two elite partners, along with our premier partner of Horizon Bank and our diamond partner of uh, uh, Sage Popovich, um, throughout the year, they, they have come together and they have sponsored the organization as a whole, along with all, the, our, all of our events. So, you know, big thank you to Franciscan um, Health, Ivy Tech, uh, Horizon, Bank, and Sage Popovich. Um, and with that, um, I would like to introduce um, our speaker, uh, Barbara Carr. And um, I believe that Mary, uh, I believe Mary Wright uh, introduced us to Barbara. And then we had a uh, conversation. And so we're real excited to, um, uh, to hear her. Um, Barbara Carr is a business leader. She's a national influencer and a professional speaker. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of Fuse Empire, uh, which owns a multitude of co companies that focuses on growing businesses and growing people. Uh, she's been working with executives um, and business owners for over a decade uh, to help them gain exposure, increase profits, and systemize their processes. Uh, she has helped her clients by becoming internationally known. She reached multi-million dollar income levels and give their workers and customers a better and more organized experience. So Barbara, uh, on behalf of myself, on behalf of the Education Committee and the Executive Board of NEWA, thank you so much. And uh, we really look forward to your presentation. I'm Barbara Carr, as um, I was just introduced, and I'll be teaching for the next four weeks on communication. And there's a few different levels of communication. We're gonna start with the very basics of communication, um, some communication etiquette some one-on-one -on -one when you're just alone with somebody, it's just you and another person, what kind of communication etiquette should you be focused on? Some of the do's and don'ts. As the weeks go on, we'll take it a step further each week. So next week we'll be um, talking about articulating your message. So those of you who are in professional industries or maybe are even business owners, uh, that'd be good for you to be able to articulate best what you do uh, when you talk to people. And then we'll talk about how to use Zoom and virtual meetings like what we're on now um, most effectively so that you can be a better communicator and a better listener and make the most of the time that you're spending on these virtual calls and conferences, especially right now during COVID. And then the last week, we'll talk about how you can actually get paid to communicate, so paid speaking. Now, I highly encourage you that even if you have no desire to speak on stage and get paid for it, I still encourage you to be here for all four weeks, not only because it's great information, but because you actually get a certificate for completing all four weeks, uh, which is an awesome perk. Uh, but you can, you'll learn things even if it's not something that you think you'll want to do. Believe it or not, I never thought I wanted to be on stage either. And look at me now. So, so it's good information even if you're not sure if you'll ever be there. And, and it's okay if you don't want to be on stage. It's not like there's something wrong with not being on stage. But just so that you know, that's what we're looking at over the next four weeks. So let's go ahead and start with the basics. One-on-one, -on -one, just you and another person, what does that look like? What are some things you should be focused on? Let's see. Oh, here we go. All right. So the first thing I like to share is listen more than you talk. A lot, a lot of people know the saying, you have two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? So, so that you can listen more than you talk. Uh, and it really is important when you're communicating, communicating with people, because when 
if somebody, you may have felt this in your own personal life where maybe you're the one who's trying to talk and every time you try to say something, the other person just interrupts you or as soon as you share what's on your heart, they automatically have a similar story. Um, and so sometimes it's best to just listen. And it, it's hard to know where that line is of when, when should I be contributing to this conversation and when should I be just listening. Um, so that's something that takes practice, but try to be mindful of that. Try to, to notice in yourself when you're in conversations with other people um, going forward, take a note of, am I listening more than, my, than I'm talking or am I the one who's talking the most? And if I am the one that's talking the most, is, is that appropriate for this? Because it doesn't mean that you can never be the one talking the most, just know when it's appropriate and when it's not. So be mindful of that. And then when you are listening, listen to listen, not to respond. And I will be honest with you guys, this is something I struggled with a lot. And I've been working on overcoming it for years. I'm much better at it now, but it took practice. So listening, when you're listening to someone speak, it's very hard not to be thinking about what, what we're going to say in response to it, right? As they say something and we have an idea, we wanna say it, but we don't wanna interrupt them. So we're thinking in our mind, oh, when, when she stops talking, I'm gonna mention this. Or after he's done with this, I'll, I'll explain why he should have did this or how, how I did it. And so that, that's easy to do. We're human beings, we want to help other people. So we naturally want to respond when somebody's telling us something. And again, like you learned in the last point, you don't always have to respond. There are times when it's best not to respond, um, to just be silent and listen. But when you are listening, be sure to be focused on what the person is saying, not what you're going to say next. Now, if you feel like you've been um, guilty of that yourself, feel free to like uh, put a thumbs up or uh, in, in your uh, text or in your in your Zoom, there's a spot where you could raise your hand and where you can do like a clap. I think you could do different types of emojis. Feel free to interact with that because it lets me know that you guys are still listening to me. <laughs> um, I, As I'm sharing my screen, all I can see is my screen. So I cannot see any of you. So if you're like waving your hand or smiling or thumbs up, I can't see that on here. And that's something we'll go into on week three when we talk about virtual meetings. <clears throat> but in the meantime, feel free to put stuff in the chat and, and, and do the thumbs up and anything like that to let me know that you're still here. Okay, so moving forward, limit your distractions. This is also a hard one in today's world because we all have phones that ding like crazy. <clears throat> I always say, don't answer or look at your phone when you're meeting with someone else, if at all possible. I know there's sometimes when there's an emergency or your kids are you know, away from you, so you've got to pay attention to what they're doing or maybe a client calls. But what happens, you guys, is if, if you're looking at your phone when, when somebody else is talking to you, even if you're just checking it real quick, you pick it up, you check it, and then you set it back down, what that tells the person across from you is, oh, there's something else more important than this. And there very well might be. But limit how often you do that because it, it's rude, really. And the other person on the other side, we feel like maybe I should have had this meeting. It, it, clearly, this person is too busy for what I'm trying to share with them. And so if you are able to not look at your phone, not answer your phone, I urge you to do so because it's like, the other person, even if they don't say it, they're feeling offended. They're feeling like they don't matter. They're not important. And even if you can have your phone not out or not on the table, I see times when people will sit down at a meeting with me and they will bring their phone out and set it down in front of them on the table, almost between us. And I think, oh, okay. <laughs> so um, the, again, the other person probably won't tell you that they're offended or feeling less important but chances are they are. So if you could put your phone away, completely out of the picture, right, in, in, in your bag or somewhere else, if you do have to set it on the table, maybe because you're, you're waiting on an emergency phone call or something urgent, put it upside down on the table. That way you don't see every single time that a notification comes in, okay? 
Try to be as respectful as possible with your phone. I know it's hard, guys. Trust me, we're in a world that we live by our phones, but it will show that other person a level of respect that you can never articulate with words. The next thing is to ask clarifying questions. And so you're sitting here, you're talking with someone, they, they speak, you're listening. And when you do respond, respond in a way that you make sure that you understand what they're saying or asking before you proceed with your response. So I might say, so Becky, let me, let me make sure I understand you correctly. What you're requesting of me to do or what you're hoping we can do together is, is that correct? Um, or you might say, oh, maybe this person is speaking to you um, as a friend and they're sharing their heart with you about <clears throat> somebody who offended them. So a clear, so it doesn't do you or them any good to say, oh yeah, that person's terrible. Just cut them out of your life. And you may say, well, when they did that to you, how did it make you feel? Right? So asking questions so that you can understand better. Now, I'm not saying go into therapy um, mode here. <laughs> Some of you on the call might actually be in the therapist industry. Um, some of you on the call might be a unwanted, um, like you don't want to be a therapist, but your friends and family make you their therapist. <laughs> um, and so, so you, you probably know what I'm speaking of. But um, make sure that you're asking questions to understand before you're responding so that you know what's appropriate. Are they wanting you to give them a solution? Are they wanting you to just listen to them? Are they wanting your help with something? Are they looking for um, you to guide them somewhere? Are they looking for a connection? Make sure you understand what it is that they're asking or in, in need of before you start blurting out all your responses. It will be more effective for both of you in that instance. The next thing that's important, especially for professionals and business owners, converse to contribute, not to sell. So when you sit down to meet with someone, even if you are at a sales meeting, for those of you who call it that, or if you're meeting one-on-one -on -one to get to know each other, to network, you should be focused on contributing to the conversation, to their life, to their business, rather than to sell. Because when, when we contribute effectively, the sale usually comes naturally. Right. So a lot of times I'll sit down with somebody on a one to one and they'll tell me that they're struggling with social media marketing. For instance, they'll say, oh, I just don't like LinkedIn. It's so awful. And, and they'll be complaining about LinkedIn. Many times they don't even know that I'm a social media um, marketer. Right. And so but sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But then so I freely give them advice. Right. Well, what is it that you don't like about LinkedIn? Oh, interesting. So you, so you don't like the fact that um, there's not as many people posting on there. Okay. Um, do you post on there? Oh, no, you don't. Okay. So, so you, would you be willing to post on there to start make, you know, to get other people to post because the more people who start posting, the you know, less likely than that you won't like it, but you've got to be the change you want to see, right? So, so I give free advice. I give free tips. Um, sometimes, sometimes I give so much free stuff that it's like, I also give that same thing that I just gave you in one of my paid classes. You got this for free. <laughs> um, I never ask them to pay me for that, of course, um, especially in a one-on-one, -on -one. but naturally after I do that, many people say something along the lines of, okay, so how do I sign up with your social media? So how do I get started with this? Um, can I pay you to do this for me? Right? So naturally it comes when you really are contributing to somebody else's life or somebody else's business genuinely. So, so when you sit down to talk, be focused on helping, on contributing, on giving value rather than to sell. And one of the, one of my biggest pet peeves, be on time. Your arrival time tells me how important this meeting is to you. And it tells me how much you respect my time. And I'm not the only person who feels that way. Um, I tell my kids that this is how their employer is going to feel about them. If they're going in for an interview, I have two teenagers. So if they're going in for an interview for a job, they need to be early. In fact, um, for church, I use this with my, my son is 17. And, you know, church, if church starts at 1030, James likes to show up at like 1032. 
And um, that's one of the things that really bothers me because I'm like, James, you're late. Um, and then he'll start showing up at like 1030. And I'm like, you're still late. And he's like, no, it starts at 1030. You're pulling into the parking lot at 1030. That is not on time. Like, if it starts at 1030, you should be in the room ready to worship at 1030, right? Um, you should have already gotten your coffee if you want coffee. You should have already talked to whoever you want to talk with and mingle and be in your seat and ready before it starts, right? At school, if school starts at 9 a.m., you don't pull into the parking lot at 9 a.m. Like, it just makes sense. You have to be in your class before that bell rings at 9 a.m., so as students, we, we grew up learning that when that bell rang at 9 a.m. or whatever time your bell rang, that's when you were tardy. So why in our adult lives do we now think that if our meeting starts at 9 a.m. that we should be pulling into the parking lot at 9 a.m.? And then ordering our coffee before we sit down. And by the time we sit down with the person in front of us, it's 9.10 or 9.15. And I have another appointment at 9.30 or 10 o'clock or whatever time. And so it's like, it, I just feel very unimportant, unappreciated, disrespected um, at times like that. So I would encourage you to be on time, whether that's a phone call, whether that's an in-person meeting, uh, whether that's one of these Zoom meetings. Um, if you have a scheduled appointment, be on time. I mean, you guys, if we're not on time for our doctor appointment, they reschedule us and still make us pay, <laughs> right? Like you still have to pay the, the cancellation fee, even if, you, if, if you're more than 15 minutes late or whatever it is. Utilize this in your business as well and in your professional. I know not everyone on here is in a business. A lot of you are um, high-level executives and professionals. Um, so utilize this. You, you, if you walked into a client meeting late, imagine what they would feel, right? Um, if, if you had a big contract that you were looking to put a proposal on, do you think that they're more or less likely to say yes if you walk in late, right? Because remember, our first impression goes a long way. And if our first impression is that we walk in late, um, that's that's rough. So you are already are starting on a bad note when you do that. If you do have another meeting that is after the meeting that you're sitting down at, specify that at the beginning of the meeting. So like I just said, I have a, a 9 a.m. I'm sitting down with you at 9 a.m. Let's say I also have a 10 o'clock after that, right? I reserve one hour for our meeting. I have another meeting that starts at 10. As soon as you and I sit down at 9 a.m., I'm going to say, hey, Mary, I'm so glad you were able to meet with me today. I just want to let you know I do have another meeting at 10 o'clock. So I just want I've got to make sure I wrap this up before that. It's more respectful to say that at the beginning of the meeting than to wait until 9.55 and be like, oh, I have to go. I'm so sorry. I have to go. I have another meeting at 10. Because then it feels abrupt. And then I, I'm like, oh, I still had other things I wanted to tell you. But if I know that our meeting has to end at 9.55, back at 9 o'clock, I know that. I'll, I'll make sure to get out everything I want to share before that time. So make sure that you're letting people know expectations of how long your meeting will be. Um, if you're calling somebody unexpectedly, you might say, um, hey, is it okay if I have 15 minutes of your time? Or do you have five minutes? Um, I have a quick question. So if you let them know ahead of time how much time you plan to take, they're more likely to be um, receptive to that. So even when you're scheduling a meeting with someone, you might even say, hey, I'd like to get on your calendar for 30 minutes. Or, um, you know, hey, I'd like to schedule time with you for an hour. Knowing that up front is helpful to all parties. Um, okay, so let's see. So the next thing, I, um, actually, let's take a, a, a second here because I see there's something in the chat and this is actually one of my breaking points. As you see, there's a, a blank slide here on purpose to remind me that, um, <laughs> that there's a breaking spot. For some reason, it won't let me see my chat while I'm sharing my screen. So, so actually, whoever put something in the chat, if it's a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. Hey, Barb, what they're asking for is they're asking for the slides. This is Andrea uh, of the presentation, and we will send out the slides to everyone. Perfect. Thank you, Andrea. Sure. All right. So with that said, um, each time we come to a blank slide like this, which is about three times in this presentation, um, I will ask for any questions. 
That's also the time when I'm gonna make sure to take a drink of my water. Any of you who speak know that it, sometimes speaking a lot makes you thirsty, especially when you're outside. <laughs> um, I have two other people in the house who are working from home inside the house. I figured it was better for me to be outside so we weren't talking over each other. All right, so let's move on to now that you've had a meeting with someone and you're going to follow up with them and stay in touch with them, what kind of things are important regarding communication that you should keep in mind? The first thing is to be mindful of other people's desired communication methods. So an example would be, um, maybe I prefer to text over phone calls, but my, my client or the person who I'm trying to reach prefers emails. It's, he or she doesn't like text messages at all. In fact, they ignore text. They don't even know how to respond to text maybe. So you have to understand what their preferred communication method is so that you could best reach them. Um, a good example is millennials love to text and love social media, right? Um, people who are um, baby boomers, for instance, uh, most of them, not all, prefer email, right? Or phone call. I actually had a client one time, I texted him and I don't know exactly how old he was, but he was probably older than my parents. And he, he uh, called me right after I texted him and he called me and he said, I just got something on my phone that I don't know. Are you sending me a message? I don't know how to read it. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, he actually does not know how to even open a text message. I later taught him how to open a te text message. But even to this day, when I want to reach that particular client, I pick up my phone. I dial like old times, right? I, I, call him and I speak to him the way he prefers to speak, right? He's more comfortable on the phone than he is in any, he doesn't even like email. In fact, when he emails me, <laughs> it looks like he's shouting at me and you'll learn that in a moment too. But um, so knowing how other people prefer to communicate will go a long way in your follow-up. You may have reached out to somebody following up after a meeting, 10 or 12 times, but if all of those times were maybe via email or maybe via phone call, you're not reaching them the way they want. Try a text message instead or try whatever you've already tried and they're not responding, try a different method because it's not that they just don't like you or they're ignoring you. A lot of times it's inconvenient for them to reach out to you in the method that you're attempting. So for instance, a lot of stay-at-home moms or work-at-home moms, it's difficult to get on a phone call. It's really hard. In fact, one of the ladies on here today said, I'm working from home, so I'm keeping my video off because like, you know, I don't look my as great as I'd like to today. Um, and many of us do that. I look, I look uh, presentable today because I had speaking gigs. Otherwise, when I am at home, I don't always like, you know, do anything special. I'm, I'm usually wearing my husband's t-shirt, right? Because I don't have Zoom calls, I have phone calls. But when you know that you'll be on a Zoom call, you, you tend to get dressed up more. But knowing that if somebody is a stay-at-home mom, they probably don't want to have a Zoom call, or maybe it might be hard for them to have a phone call. Not saying it's impossible or that it's never the case, but keep that in mind, especially if they have very young children that they're always chasing, right? Like every time they turn away, that kid is doing something else. Um, those of you who have kids, no matter how old they are, you know what that's like. So be mindful of that if that's who you're meeting with. The next thing is don't only reach out to someone when you need something or you have something to sell. I can almost bet that every person on this call has had somebody reach out to them out of the blue. You haven't heard from this person in 15 years since you went to high school with them or, or college or whatever. And then they say, hey, I just want you to know that I just found this new great product and blah, 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 blah. They never even said my name. They didn't even say hi, Barbara. They just started vomiting their new sell, sell, sales product all over me. And I'm like, you didn't even say hi. You didn't even ask how I was doing. You didn't even like wonder if I'm like still in the area. Like there was no, it was just like buy this from me because I knew you once upon a time. People don't get excited about that. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but that's not something I look forward to every morning when I wake up. And so... So if you've been 
um, on the receiving end of that, you know what I'm talking about. You probably already thought of somebody who did that to you just this week, right? Um, and if you're on the sending end of that, I'm hoping that this will help you to know that it's best to, to reach out to people even when you don't need something. In fact, in my marketing courses that I teach, I have what I call a kindness call. Um, I teach people that you should have a set amount of kindness calls that you do every day or every week. And your kindness calls are literally just calling to be kind. So I might call up um, Bridget and say, you know, I, I get on the phone, Bridget answers and I say, hey, Bridget, I just want you to know that I'm thinking about you. I'm hoping you're doing well and just wondering what you're up to. And Bridget, usually the first response, the first time I ever give somebody a kindness call, the people who have been part of this for some time know when I'm calling, they'll say, oh, you're doing a kindness call. This is so sweet. I'm so happy to hear from you. I, every time I'm having a bad day, you call. I'm so excited. But the first time I ever call somebody on a kindness call, their response is, what? You just want to know how I'm doing? Like, what do you want? Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're so confused because they're not used to people just really genuinely wanting to say hi and, and see how they're doing without needing anything. And you guys, it's so easy to do a kindness call, even if you only did one per day. Call somebody randomly, and it doesn't have to be randomly. Mine are very strategic. I have a very strategic system, um, but yours can be random. When you first start out, when I first started, it was random. I created a system after doing random. But call somebody up and just be kind. Don't ask for anything. Um, give if you can. If, if they're struggling with something and you're able to give, give. Don't ask for anything. Um, in fact, I, I had this with one of my teenagers recently who she was like talking about my sister, who, who's her aunt, obviously. She's like, you know, I feel like Debbie only thinks I call when I need stuff. I feel real bad. And I was like, well, do you only call when you need stuff? And she's like, yeah, because I'm about to call her and see if I could babysit for some money because I need some money. <laughs> and so, so I was able to use that as an example of, you know, like, don't just call when you need something. So I said, okay, well, then don't call and ask to babysit this time. Use this time right now to call and say, hey, Debbie, I'm just calling to see how you're doing because I love you and I miss you, right? I, I just want you to know that I love you. Use this time to do that. And then in a couple days, then you could reach back out and say, hey, I'm wondering if you want to go out and do something and I'll come babysit, right? So, so when you feel that urge to reach out to someone just to do it because you want to sell them something or because you need something, stop yourself in your tracks and say, nope, I'll save that conversation for next week. This week, I'm going to reach out and genuinely see what this person is up to, what they're doing. I want to get to know them again. If it's been a while since I talked to them, I want to get to know them again and see what's going on in their life. And that's it. And then next week, if it makes sense, then you could give that, that pitch or whatever you were trying to do. But stop yourself from doing it out of nowhere. Nobody likes that. And don't care who tells you they do. Nobody does. Okay? Okay. <laughs> The next thing is to be genuine in your relationship. So the example I just gave of stopping and, and being kind first, don't do that just because you're planning to make a, a sales call next week. That's not genuine. If you don't genuinely want to talk to somebody, don't talk to them to sell them either. If you don't want to have a relationship with them, if you don't want them really in your life, then you should not be trying to sell them either. If it's right for them to have your product, they'll come to you through advertising or through word of mouth or whatever. Um, it just, it feels to me, I'm, I'm one of those people, and I'm not saying it's right, wrong, or indifferent. I'm one of those people who, I get close to my clients and my prospects and my leads. Like I build relationships and friendships sometimes so much that it's hard to part ways with each other. Um, and that could be good or bad depending. But um, like, I feel like if I'm, if I'm in someone's life, I want a relationship with them. I don't want them just to be a number in my CRM. I don't want me to just be a number in their CRM. I don't want me just to be someone they call because they know that I buy, right? I don't want to just be a qualified lead. I want to be more than that. I want to be Barbara. Right? So, so keep that in mind with, with the people who you're reaching out to. They want to be a person as well. They don't just want to be a number or a lead. They want you to know them as a person. They want you to know what they like, um, what they don't like. They want you to know about their family um, to an extent, right? Some people, like I know 
my husband's an attorney and he does business uh, business law so he doesn't really get in he doesn't step into court very much um so he doesn't really have those people who are trying to like hurt him because he put him away or anything like that but he does sometimes have other people on opposing cases that he you know wins against for instance and so he doesn't use his last name on social media um, not particularly just for that reason, but even some people just in his past that he just, he doesn't want to, you know, them to reach out to him for whatever reason. And um, you may have a reason why you don't use your last name or on social media, or maybe you're not. I actually met someone recently who uses a pin name on social media. I didn't even know pin names still existed, <laughs> but, um, but it was interesting. And when I heard her reason, I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's a good, so I'm not saying there's no reason not to have that, but just know that if you are genuine in your relationship, you'll want people to know about your life and you'll want to know about theirs, right? We, when we care about people in the relationship, we do want to know about others and what's going on. I'm just making sure that I'm good on my time, which it looks like I am. So, all right, here's another breaking point. I'm gonna take a drink of water. If anyone has a question, please unmute yourself and ask. Barbara, I have one quick question. So with kindness calls, I know you were talking about how some people like texts or emails, you know, versus a call. Are, do you always do a call or do you sometimes do a text or email versus the call? So um, great question, Michelle. Thank you for asking. When I first started doing the kindness calls, um, I started with actually text messages because that's where I was comfortable. So I would send people text messages. People really enjoyed it. But then I started doing the kindness calls because somebody actually, um, I actually accidentally did a kindness call. Like I, I thought about the person and so I called them. And then her response was, I love to hear your voice when I'm stressed out like this. Like I'm having a bad day and you called me and this, this was meant to be. So thank you. And I'm happy that you didn't text me. I'm happy I heard your voice. And I thought, Oh, okay. And she's kind of the one who coined it kindness for me. Like that's where I kind of got the word kindness call because she was like, this is the kindest call I've ever received. And then I thought, oh, so it was like a kindness call. So then I started naming it kindness calls and I started making an attempt to call to use my voice instead of just my words because it's more personal. Um, I don't always make it a phone call anymore. I, I am very mindful of if somebody prefers text or something. Um, and I try to mix it up. So like, for instance, Michelle, if I were to give you a kindness call today, two or three weeks from now, when I want to, you know, touch base with you again, I might send you a text message. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could just be like, hey, Michelle, um, just thinking of you. Or it could be one of those funny gifts, right? It's just like, hey, or, you know, do something fun. So, so I do mix it up, yes, but I still kind of call it kindness calls, even if it's a text message. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? All right, I'm gonna move on then. The next thing is communication in email or text message. This one can be very, very tricky, especially if this is not your preferred method of communication. So I'm gonna share some stuff in this department. First thing is do not use all capitals. You see on my screen, this is all capitals. This is meant for a purpose, right? I'm not shouting at you. I'm giving you important information. <laughs> um, so so know, know that when you use all caps, it feels like you're being shouted at. You've probably received a message that was all caps before, and you probably thought, well, whew, why is he yelling at me? Uh, in fact, that my one client I referred to earlier, when he does email me, it's all caps, and I have showed him a million times how to make it not all caps. He still doesn't get it. He still does all caps. And so I used to, when he first sent it, I'm like, oh, why is he yelling at me? And I'm the type of person, I I used to take everything personally. I've had to grow since then. Um, I. I spend a lot of time on personal and professional development, but at first I, I would take it personally, like, oh, what I do? He's so angry. But now when I see messages from him or even others who do this, I it occurs to me that they just don't know. They just don't understand that it looks like they're shouting. Um, I have yet to receive an, a message from somebody who's literally shouting at me with all caps. Thank, thankfully, I've never actually received a real message like that. <laughs> but, um, but when you do use all caps, I know it's easier for many of you, but it looks like you're shouting. It's better to use all lowercase than all caps. And so even if you're not capitalizing the first letter of each sentence, that's better than using all caps, right? If you prefer to just do all in one, do all lowercase then. 
okay? I hope that helps someone out there. The next thing is when you are sending group emails, please, please, please use the BCC, which is blind carbon copy. So I'm going to just say this just in case somebody doesn't know. The CC means carbon copy, which means I can see everybody else's email address that you emailed it to. If you put it in just the regular to field, I can see everybody's email address. If you put it in the BCC field, it means that I'm going to receive that same message everyone else did, but I don't know who else received it because I cannot see their emails. Because here's the worst thing, and people do this, whether you realize this or not, you send me an email, there's 30 people in the group, right? I may not know any of them except for you, the person who sent it to me. Now, I may be the person who's fishing for email addresses because I'm spammy or salesy or whatever. Or maybe I'm just looking to grow my CRM or my email list or whatever. People will actually take all of those email addresses and keep them for themselves as if they know that person. And they'll re respond and they'll reach out to those people. And, um, and sometimes it's very uncomfortable because you, you don't want to be like, stop messaging me. I don't know you. Because then it feels like you're being mean to the person who put you all in the group text message together, right? So, so it's really uncomfortable. Um, and I always try telling people, don't put your, your friends or colleagues in a position of uncomfortable, being uncomfortable like that, because it, it really is weird. You don't know what to say. And like, if you're the one who sent that to me and you put me in a group message with all these people, I don't know how to respond to you to be like, hey, like, I don't want these people knowing my email address. That's personal. That's private information, right? Especially if you're using people's personal email addresses. If you give out my business email address, I don't care. I'm in business. I've got an assistant that will help me go through that and determine if it's something I need to see or not. But um, but be mindful of that because not everybody wants their email address to be shared publicly. And that's kind of what you're doing when you send a group email um, without using the BCC field. So make sure you use BCC field. The next thing is please never send a group text message without permission. So like on your phone and you send a text to like 15 people, Unless somebody is okay with that and you know that, don't do that because it's very um, distracting, sometimes annoying when my phone keeps buzzing, right? When I'm trying to talk to someone, it's like, bzz, 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 right? Because it's like, on vibrate even and it's like just buzzing and I'm trying to have a conversation and it's still distracting. Um, again, I like to put my phone away when I'm in conversations just in case of instances like that. But um. There are a time and a place for group text messages, but make sure that you are being mindful of that. So for instance, my, my daughter plays soccer. We have a group text message with the parents of the team. That's acceptable. When the coach needs to send out a message, he's a volunteer. He shouldn't have to send out 15 different messages. Um, I'm okay with that group message. My siblings and I have a group text message where we make sure we're all on the same page if something's going on with mom or dad or somebody else in the family. That's okay. I have a group text message with my husband and my kids, right? Like those things are okay. Um, I don't send group text messages to people unless I know that they're expecting it or that I know they'll be okay with it, right? Um, sometimes family's okay. I know that I, I have one particular person in my family that gets mad if, if they're part of a group text message. Um, they also get mad sometimes if they're not part of a group text message. So it's like a catch-22. But um, just be respectful of that. Not everybody likes group text messages just because it's easier for you to send it that way. So convenience is not always um, the best solution. So even if you have to send the same message 75 times, if that's more respectful to your recipient, I'd recommend doing it. Sure, it might take you 10 minutes instead of 10 seconds, but think of how that's going to be received on the other end. Okay? Same thing with Facebook messages. Um, I actually mute these. Whenever somebody puts me as part of a group text message, I either leave the group or I mute the group, which means whenever you leave a message there anyway, I won't see it. I don't like being part of those group chains unless it's something important. Like if it's um, uh, maybe something like this, you guys joined this, um, this four week um, series. This, the group that is leading it might create a group message or a Facebook message for everybody in it or a Facebook group or something like that just to remind you guys that, hey, don't forget, we're starting in 10 minutes, right? That might make sense, but for the most part, 
it doesn't make sense to send Facebook group messages, especially when they're when they don't have a real purpose, right? If I send a message to two people because I'm introducing them, that's different, right? It's different than putting a hundred people in one message because that's who you can all message at once. So be careful doing that. And then when you do introduce two people together, whether that's in a text, a Facebook message, or an email, give the contact information to both parties. So I might, if I'm introducing Michelle and Mary via email, I'll say, hey, Michelle, meet Mary, Mary, meet Michelle. Here's contact info for Mary. Here's contact info for Michelle. Here's why I think you two would be a good fit, why you two should meet each other. <clears throat> Only give this kind of introduction if you honestly feel confident that it is a good fit. Like maybe you've talked to both of them and they've both mentioned meeting the other person, but maybe they don't know the other person yet. So you've connected them. This is acceptable. If you don't know if they're a good fit, ask permission before giving contact information or making the introduction. Um, because some people might feel uncomfortable. So you might be sitting down with somebody. Um, let's use... Um, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to use any example. Let's just say you're sitting down with a professional and they say, do you know anybody else who could use this service? Why don't you put five names down on this piece of paper for me and I'll contact them. Before I ever put anybody's names down on those paper, I get out my phone and I text or call them and I say, hey, um, let's use carpet cleaning for an instance, for example. I don't think if someone is a carpet cleaner in here, this is good for you too, but if you're not, that's okay. But um, <clears throat> I was trying not to use an industry that somebody would like get offended that I was using them. So let's say I'm getting my carpet cleaned and um, the person asks, hey, give me five referrals. I will message or call the five people who I do think would be a good fit and say, um, hey, I'm getting my carpet clean. They did an awesome job. They're, they're, wanting some, they're wanting to do this with some other people. They're not going to charge you for it or this is the price or whatever. Would it be okay if I give them your information to call you? Right? And then, oh, yeah, yeah. Or maybe I know that this is a good fit because I talked to Susie and Susie says she was looking for her carpet clean. So I go ahead and write Susie down. But then I'm going to text Susie and say, hey, awesome news. Just got my carpet cleaned. I gave them your information. I know you're looking for it too. So be waiting for a call from Brad. Right? Or whatever. So being in communication with people because what happens is I had somebody the, um, a couple years ago actually. Um, he was my life insurance agent. Um, actually, he, I still have life insurance through him. I do life insurance, a few different companies. But um, so he's one of my life insurance reps. And I gave him my sister's information and my cousin's information. Because I thought they both needed life insurance. But I also thought they both would be a good fit to possibly be interested in selling life insurance. And, and when I explained it to my life insurance rep in that manner, Something happened in communication when he gave that information to his assistant because the assistant called my sister and was like, hey, I have a job for you, a job opportunity. So my sister was confused because I had told her already that she would be getting a call from this person um, both to learn about life insurance and maybe see if she'd be, want to be interested in having that as a career. But when the person called, they made it sound like it was a job opportunity which was very confusing to my sister. She didn't even know that was the person that I sent them because it wasn't what I, what I thought they were doing. Um, long story short, it's a great company. My rep is a great person. His, recept his assistant is still great. She's wonderful. It was a complete miscommunication. Okay, so making sure that you know who should be recommended, how to recommend them, and informing them of who will be. Because here's the thing too, when I told my sister that this person was going to contact her, I told her my insurance agent's name, which was a man. When his assistant called, she's a woman with a completely different name, obviously. And so it, there, it was very confusing how that all happened. So I recommend making sure that both people have the contact information of the other, including their name, phone, email, whatever they need, so that if they if they're reached out to by the person, they know that, oh, this came from Barbara. This is who Barbara said was going to contact me. Um, and it, it's really annoying when I get a call that somebody's like, Oh, hey, I'm calling because John Doe told me that you'd be a really good fit for this new makeup I'm offering. And I'm like, I don't even wear makeup. 
Like, why would somebody give my number to, like, like, it's really confusing. If you don't know if I'm a good fit or if I'm not, in, if I'm interested or not, then just ask me because that just wasted a phone call for that other person who they could have been reaching out to somebody else who would have been a better fit. So, um, so know those things before giving introductions. And if you don't know, just ask. It doesn't hurt to ask. Another important thing when you are sending emails, if you're sending emails for your professional use, you should be using a professional email address. So daddy's girl 99 is not a professional email address. Um, a lot of times email addresses like that um, get overlooked because it's confusing that usually like you're like, is this person spamming me? Is this an email that I don't want to open because it might be a, like a virus or hacked or something like that? Like that stuff was really cute when we were in high school. But it's not so cute when you're a professional, right? Like, we've got to be mindful of that. So my email address now is barbara at fuseempire.com. That's my professional email address. Um, I have a personal email address that I give, like, when I go to the doctor's office um, or if I give to my cousin or something like that. I do have a professional email address that I use, or I mean a, per a personal email address that I use for personal reasons. Um, my kids' school stuff comes to my personal email address, right? But my professional email address, when I'm giving someone in business my email address, or if I want them to connect me, introduce me to someone else, I want them to use my professional email address, not my personal email address, even if the person has my personal one. Some of the people in my my business relationships have my personal email address because I consider them friends. But I want you to use my professional one if you're sending me business. And then um, my favorite one with um, email and text is to use your words wisely. It is so easy to get to be misunderstood and to miscommunicate in the written word than it is in verbal word. So you may send something and you mean it in the best of ways, but then I read it and I'm like, why would she say that to me? Right. And I say this jokingly, but, but we do this a lot. I think women probably more than men. And that might be because, <coughs> excuse me, might be because we have a lot more emotions and, um, and we use our emotions in a lot of fun ways. Right. And, I find myself sometimes getting offended by something that somebody said, but then I'll take it to my husband and say, babe, when you read this message, what do you think? And then he'll say something that just seems completely logical. And I'm like, so I shouldn't be offended. Like she's not saying something mean about me. Right. Like I, I have, I'm so grateful that I have a husband that I can, you know, take this to and be like, please, please tell me your take on this. Um, of course, if it's something like personal to the other person, I'm not going to show it to my husband if it's something that's private to them. But, but a lot of times I do misunderstand what people say. And it's good to have a second opinion or to respond back to the person and say, I'm sorry, I don't think I understand what you're trying to say. Or asking clarifying questions, right? Like, are, do you mean this or are you saying this? Um, because otherwise... If I just assume that this person is being rude to me, I'm going to have um, a negative feeling towards them. And then they might be sensing this negativity from me and be wondering, why is she mad at me? And then you have all this miscommunication that just ends not good, right? So, so communication, in my opinion, is the most important thing in everything in life, in our relationships, in our business, right? Like with my clients, I... I I do my best to communicate with them as often as possible. If, if I'm not able to meet a deadline, I let them know. I, I don't just ignore it. I say, hey, I know I was going to have this done by Friday. I actually need till Saturday, right? Like, I'm so sorry something came up or whatever. I, of course, try to never have to do that. But if I have to, I'm honest about it. Because otherwise, if you just ignore the situation, uh, which I'll be honest, I did in my past, right? When I was early on in this, sometimes I would just ignore it. And that didn't help at all. Um, so I had to learn from that. But, but being honest and communicating in, in your relationship with your friends, your family, your spouse, your children, your employer, your employees, I think, and again, in my opinion, communication is the number one tool and asset that we have that can make or break us, that can make or break our relationships, that can um, be, it, it's just so important. 
we can use communication effectively and um, and it could do great things for us or we can use it ineffectively and it can ruin a lot of things for us and again i know from both sides of this i know from both ends of this spectrum i have been a bad communicator in my life and it did bad things for me i have been a great communicator in my life and it has done great things for me <clears throat> I still don't think I'm a perfect communicator. I think there's still a lot more I can learn in communication. Uh, again, I work through personal and professional development regularly, so I'm always learning new ways to communicate. And um, in fact, um, in marriage class, my husband and I do marriage class at our church, I learn something new every week there, not just about marriage, but about communication, ways that I could communicate more effectively with my husband, right? Ways that, that I could let him know how I'm feeling in ways that doesn't get me all emotional or confuse him, right? So, so communication is so important. And that's one of the reasons why we started with this as the basic number one at the beginning, because if you can't communicate one-on-one, -on -one, or in these smaller different ways, it's gonna be much harder to communicate when you get in groups or when you add um, electronics um, to the mix or when you are up on stage. It's much harder if you can't do this one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and it takes practice. So if you feel like you've got work to do, start practicing, start working, start being mindful because um, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Another thing with text messaging and emailing, don't use abbreviations in professional messages. Um, I think even when you're like friends with somebody, it, it takes that to a different level. I try not to. I'd be lying if I say I never did. I definitely do sometimes. And then I'm like, oh, man, I can't believe I did that. But um and when my teenager, sometimes she'll be, when, when I'm driving and she's in the passenger seat and I'll have her <clears throat> um, responding to my messages for me because I don't text and drive. That's something that I'm, I'm very much not okay with um, for me or my children. And so, so I'll have her responding to my messages for me and I'll remind her that if it's a professional message, I say, Alyssa, this is a client. Please make sure that you are using words properly, use grammar, um, create a professional message here, right? So a message to my client looks very different than a message to my sister. Um, and, and my daughter knows that she's, she's learning that through me. And I'm hoping that it is something that she's able to use in her adult life as well. Um, so you don't abbreviate in professional messages. All right, here we're on a blank screen again. So I'm going to open it up to questions, comments, or concerns. Okay, I'm going to check the time. I see that we're running out. So um, I'm going to go through these one, these last ones super quick because I want to leave time for Andrea to give her stuff at the end too. Okay, when you are an audience member, listen to learn, right? If you're in the audience, you should be listening to learn, not to judge. As audience members, we a lot of times judge who's up on stage. It doesn't help you or them. So listen to learn. Engage with the speaker, nod, laugh, smile, do things that lets the speaker know that you're listening and that you're still um, paying attention. And then when you're on the phone, these ones are super important. If you're using speakerphone, tell the other person, especially if there are other people around. There's something I might not want someone else to know if you're on speakerphone. Be mindful of your volume. A lot of us speak louder when we're talking on the phone than we do when we're in person. I'm one of those people. I shout when I'm on the phone. I try not to. I'm probably shouting at you guys now. <laughs> um, next week, we're going to talk about articulating your message. So that might be what people call elevator pitch, 30 second commercial, um, or just one on one telling people what you do. And then we'll talk about virtual meetings and how to get paid to speak. And I've got my contact information up on the screen, but I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Andrea now for the last remarks. I better unmute there. Okay. Um, Barbara, thank you. I, I really want to thank you. Um, there were so many times in your presentation today that I said to myself, well, I know what you just said. And then I reflected and I'm like, darn it, I need to listen better. I need to do this again. You know, I, I, you know, I have to get back on my diet. And in more ways than one, Michelle. Um, but it's, it's hard not, it's hard to listen and it's hard not to 
um, already for me think forward three sentences ahead and finish their conversation for them and stuff. So um, I found it valuable. I found um, several, several great nuggets that I could take away from. And now if I could only apply, um, I would appreciate, um, I, you know, that would be really great. Um, so what we're going to do, remember this is a four week program. Um, we're going to send the slides to everyone for the next, for me. Um, and so I'm going to assume you're all like me for the next, um, uh, presentation next Wednesday. I, we're going to send out, if you would, kind of an agenda with what she's going to talk about because I, I would have liked to have followed it a little bit more and, and take my notes a little bit better um, with that even during the, during the presentation instead of after it. So we're going to get that together for you guys and we'll send that out before next, uh, next week's presentation. Um, we do look forward to any constructive um, um, comments that you may have, please send them over to us. Um, and uh, that would be very helpful to us. And, and you know, like, like uh, Barbara said, let's be positive about it. This is our first one. We had 50 people who joined us today, um, which is just amazing. Um, and uh, any other comments or anything that we can help you with? Uh, if you have any other educational programs that you would like to uh, see us um, uh, produce for you, um, let us know. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, feel free to um, communicate with Barbara or to myself or to any of, of our committee members or any other NEWA members. Um, and then we will see everyone next week.